Right. With that, we will transition to our first uh, panel discussion talking about the impact of professional sport on community. And I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Lowe to moderate our panel discussion. Hello, everybody. I am delighted to be with you all today and really excited to present to you this group of amazing individuals that has quite, quite a story. Every single one of them could tell about our, our community here. I am the director of the Intercollegiate Professional Court Management Program here at UNLV. Um, anybody who's in court management would probably be shocked to learn that, that this program, my master's degree program, actually started in 2021. So we just graduated our first class this May, which is largely because we didn't have professional sport in Las Vegas um, prior to, as you heard, 2017. And so it really wasn't until all of these things started happening that the upper administration, NG, our, our uh, governing board of the state, would get behind the support of creating a sport management program. So I want to direct them to Sherry the fact that we have sport here in Las Vegas. Um, I'm also director of the um, Sport Innovation Institute here at um, UNLV, and that is also a group that tries to do very much what this talk is trying to do. We try to break down the boundaries and bring people together. We found that we have nearly 100 faculty here at UNLV that have been engaged in sport research of some sort. So anything from engineering to obviously sociology, history, and dentistry. Um, it's a very wide ranging um, group of folks that have done different types of, of research related to sports here at UNLV. So that kind of centers us and situates us as what we hope to be known as, which is the intellectual capital of sport and entertainment. And with that, I get to introduce the folks that are at the center of that. So beginning to my left, Dr. Um, Lisa Motley is the senior director of sport marketing at the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority, it's a mouthful, we just say the LVCDA. They're the ones, you don't know, most places have a sport commission, but probably what the LVCDA is most known for is a little commercial in which the tagline was, if it happens in Vegas, right? There you go, it stays in Vegas, right? That is one of the most famous branding, um, in fact, award-winning brand campaigns ever. And that was the LVCDA. Um, this is going to share with you our most recent ad campaign here in a minute. But she is a veteran of, both, of all, all things Vegas, casino, hotel, sports, uh, special events, advertising, marketing. She is um, in charge of special events, so very much like what you're going to hear, um, directly related to bringing the Super Bowl here to Vegas, directly related to bringing the NHL um, All-Star Game and festivities here to Las Vegas. Long before that, big major events that you probably weren't aware of. The National Finals Rodeo is actually an event that is one of the biggest economic impacts every single year for the city of Las Vegas. It has been for, for decades. Um, and that's largely because the LBCDA worked very hard to keep them here. Um, so that event in and of itself had Las Vegas situated as a sport town, but it really wasn't until we started getting the teams to town. One of the things that Lisa has done uh, most recently, the other real big game changer here in Vegas was, of course, when the Supreme Court made the ruling that allowed other states to have sport bets. Right, so that's 2018, another huge game changer that opened up so many doors. You might not have thought it would open up doors in Vegas, but prior to that, the NCAA would not allow Las Vegas to host any sanctioned events. It did one, two, or three; it didn't matter. Nothing could be hosted in Las Vegas. After that ruling. Lisa went to work, and I think the number is right around 100 um, bids that she put in for NCAA events. So think about that. The minute that that turned, they got to work on nearly 100 bids for NCAA events, and we will now be, and already are, and have hosted NCAA events here in Las Vegas. So truly, the idea of sport being a game changer is as real as could be possible, um, largely because of the work of, first of all, Lisa, and then Sam, Sam Joffrey. Um, Sam is currently the uh, executive director of the Super Bowl host committee here in Las Vegas. So in February, we will be the next site for the Super Bowl. I'm sure you can tell us exactly how many days we'll be on for what we're going to do. Yeah, 
But what's fascinating about that, Sam has spent his career hosting these kinds of mega events. And he put on Super Bowls in places like Louisiana, the Superdome, and other major sites coming to Vegas, working very closely with Lisa to secure the Super Bowl bid here. If you're not familiar with how that happened, basically Louisiana um, kind of has a set date on their calendar, it's called Mardi Gras, mm -hmm. that um, conflicted with the Super Bowl. And so all of a sudden there was this need to have a Super Bowl move. And these folks went to work, made that happen, and that's how it is that we have the Super Bowl so soon. Um, along with that, Sam got a really, really short runway to make the Super Bowl happen here. He got in town last January. Typically, they get four years, right, of lead time to make a Super Bowl happen in the city. He got not even a few months. Yeah, yeah. And he has a massive staff of 12 people. Um, <laughs> That is also supported by some UNLV students, which we'll hear about that here in a minute, how, how we work together to, to build that relationship. And lastly, um, Andrew Woods is our director of the Center for Business and Economic Research here at UNLV. Um, Andrew does all kinds of interesting work with regards to the economy here at UNLV, as I imagine, so it's very heavily related to gaming and the sport industry. But um, I think every month or so, he's hosting what we call Brew with Views which I absolutely love, bringing the community together on some specific area of the economy. So arts and entertainment happened very recently. Um, obviously, we hosted a sport um, center in economic rooms and views earlier in the year. And he just does these consistently. Um, but more importantly, very recently, we worked together. And I think this week, he is releasing a white paper on the sport economy in Las Vegas. So this is the first of its kind. It's been a fun, um, fun journey working on this, and I think it will be very um, enlightening for a lot of folks to see the numbers and see what has happened in Las Vegas. So with that, I am going to transition to just asking, I would say, kind of a, a softball question. Um, starting off with big picture question. How has sport impacted the Las Vegas perspective from your community? And I'll start with you, Lisa, since you have been here the longest and seen the most change. Well, first, thank you for having that point. Um, you know, kind of and obviously, I'm going to be out here or not. Okay. Well, again, thank you for having me this morning. Honored to be with you, gentlemen, and uh, uh, absolutely just for documenting that we've not had close together over the years. Um, sports in Las Vegas, you're talking to a kid who grew up in Minneapolis. Yeah. Um, there we go. Um, sports town, USA. I moved to Las Vegas and I came to the casino. So I actually love that industry. Put me down into sports and watched how this town just took off. When I came on to the LDCBA, we knew the Golden Knights were coming. It was December of 2016, but that's all we knew. We did not know the Raiders were coming. We did not know where the Penn State mass from the gym. We did not know the Aces were coming. We lost the Ace Lights or everything else you mentioned in the stream. Um, our role at the LBCB, and I had that awesome job of driving tourism for sports programming. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But me at the Las Vegas Club for 23 years, this is my home and my community. So while it's not my job, it is my responsibility as a resident of Las Vegas to make sure the community is involved in every step of the way. Uh, we can talk about the final four bid. We work very closely with UNLV and all those 110 bids we did today with UNCLA. They are our host institution. But part of that is sustainability. Part of, I'm sure you'll talk about business again. How do we offer jobs to the community? How are we going out to the underserved areas and making sure that sports isn't a barrier for them for careers or to play? So everything we do, yeah, the job 100% of sports programming, but the responsibility as a team then is to make sports and the community come up. Sam, from your perspective, have you seen how post sport is impacting the Las Vegas community? Now you haven't been here as long, but well, uh, yeah, I, I think as you laid out earlier, it's pretty fascinating. That just you know, five years ago, you couldn't say the NFL and Vegas in the same sentence, and all of a sudden you go to Super Bowl and Phoenix, and they've got draft teams set up outside the fan experience for the field goals to make five dollars in free play. So it's been quite the evolution between uh, uh, sports and, and, and Vegas and. and working in twenty twenty one with Lisa and her team to put together the bid to host Super Bowl is. A really, really uh, exciting time to watch the birth of this first, the first Super Bowl in Vegas. I think it's going to be the first of many, many Super Bowls here. Um, but it's uh, it, it's opened up a lot of doors. Uh, creating the first host committee, the first step after you get awarded a Super Bowl, you have to create a separate entity to sign the contracts with the NFL. 
for raising money, to deliver all the promises you made to the NFL, all the obligations, but also putting into place all those things that happen for the community. And, uh, you know, we do a big bucket of stuff for the NFL as far as paying for staffing and stadium and transportation and public safety type stuff. But then there's a whole bucket of things that we do for the community. And uh, that's what's been the most exciting, watching how, you know, whether it's 15,000 people signing up to volunteer or hundreds of companies signing up to be part of the Business Connect program, which connects the uh, local businesses with uh, the procurement process around Super Bowl. Designing all these programs, community affairs programs, environmental programs, um, that will have a legacy moving forward and hopefully can be recycled or kept in place for all of the important events that we start preparing, whether it's a Final Four or future college ball championship game. All these major events now require a host committee. Hopefully, we're laying the groundwork, not just for the Super Bowl, but right for all the major sports events. Yeah, I, I don't know about you all, but I was I was kind of blown away when I learned this. I thought the NFL went on the Super Bowl. You know, I mean, they have all the money, they have all the people. They know. That's true. That's true. But yeah, so I, I've learned a lot from Sam already, just um, in finding out what you know it is he was tasked with because when he got here, it was literally a tent. Um, and he went to the four hiring people here locally to build that massive 12 person crew. Um, yeah, but, a big part of that building of the process started here uh, at a class I was at. We tried to speak to him. We talked about I had budgeted to do one semester of paid internships for the semester of Super Bowl that, that next coming fall. Um, I've seen so many times when we have major sporting events I was involved with in the past that we could put up a posting for unpaid internships and have a line of kids around the corner lined up to do it. They would bus students in from other states to come take these internships. And we looked at that and said, you know, all those students have one thing in common, they can afford to do an unpaid internship. So we designed a paid one that was a really robust little program, not only paid for their, their uh, hourly rate, but uh, picking up their tuition that they have to pay to get the three hours of credit for their class, um, all the IT and, and, and clothing and everything else. But on paper, the program looks so good that the NFL Foundation looked at it and said, we love that, we'll match that so you can do two semesters worth. And then United Way came on board and said, we love that, we'll let you do three semesters worth. So we're able to start the program uh, and run it for a full year over four semesters now. So um, it all started with your class. We are the direct beneficiary. So I'm surprised about the company. We are one of the most diverse universities in the country. Um, so the focus of this initiative in particular was diversity. Um, we definitely know that one of the barriers to diverse people being able to take part in internships is the cost factor, right? And so I really applaud Sam for his work in reaching out to the foundation and getting that funding. And then our workforce innovation um, initiative, uh, Jake Biggers was the one that got the relationship with United Way, so we had full funding. We've already had. Yeah, we're another 22 to go. Yeah, that's 22 to go. Can you imagine? Fall semester is going to be the lead up to the Super Bowl. Just think about that. How cool is it to be a student working with Sam and his team headed right into the Super Bowl? That's just about it. And they are being excited. Yeah, she may say something else. One of my graduates is here. You know, for a fact, they're getting real first hand experiences. I'm, I'm the one that gets to hear what they're doing. Um, and so they're not, this is not. Donuts and coffee kind of work. It's, it's, they're working. All right, Andrew, your turn. What do you think that you've seen um, as far as the impact of folks going here in Las Vegas? Well, Nancy, thank you for having me. And um, so I, I said, I grew up in Seattle. I've been here for 10 years. And as someone who didn't have hockey growing up or have a professional sports uh, team and then had our NBA team were off of us, it's been really fun to be living in Las Vegas the last 10 years and see the growth of the sport. And as economists and my team, you know, we even just started our Monday morning meeting this week talking about the Golden Knights, right? And what kind of led us down this road, we've been working for uh, well, about a year ago when we started talking to you and Jay and John and the team, is essentially it feels different. But then it was like, well, feeling isn't, how do you measure that? Feeling right, it's not just culture. So, as economists, we always want to know well, what about the jobs. And we've seen some of those numbers in jobs. They're really like, well, is that true or not? We're supposed to look at that. There could be spin offs. You know, the literature in the economics isn't always positive on the economic impact of, of sport itself. But I think Vegas is different, right? You have one in four of our workers are tied to leisure and hospitality. One in three of our dollars generated outside of that are tied to leisure and hospitality. So, it's a 
case study potentially in how this community was growing and changing. You look at how quickly we bounced back after the pandemic. Would that have happened without Tory? So it was kind of factual. So we've been looking at that and we have this white paper. We published it. It's on our website, cber.unlv.edu under research and reports. And it's it's just a white paper kind of summarizing what we're seeing, what we're meant, how we're able to measure to provide a baseline five years in now, like how many questions for where we to sit. And then use that for other researchers or for our own research of where do we go from here and what can we measure in the past. And I think, you know, probably I think Nancy, you're gonna ask me five things. I, I'll say just at least one, just from that white paper that was striking to me, is that about five percent of all uh, spending generated from tourism in Southern Nevada we can tie back to sport. So one in twenty for all the dollars. So about one point one eight billion dollars as of twenty twenty two. And if you think we're at thirty eight million visitors as of twenty twenty two, that's not back to our future. I think there's forty two million visitors a year and we're forecasting, assuming that the economy continues to have a lot. It's another thing I'll come up on about the economy. But, but we assume that, you know, in the next couple of two years, three years, we're going to surpass that number, looking at the forecast and looking at the number of generate. So we can see that sport is helping strengthen the industry we have. We see that there are also what was really kind of fun with this white paper was to get out beyond just the strip and look at the community at large, how that is impacting culture with new sports, amateur sports. You know, people going out and having some people on a Friday or Saturday night to see, say, a silver dice instead, or uh, some of these minor league teams. And you can see the popularity of that. You can also see the establishment of new businesses created. So, uh, since 2010, in terms of the number of instructional facilities, so coaching or any sort of recreational instruction, uh, that's increased 151%, the number of establishments in Southern Nevada. It went from around 66 to 166 establishments. So you can really you can see some of those economic impact of generating entrepreneurship, creativity, jobs, but also a sense of belonging and a sense of culture. Of course, that drives us to other questions, and those aren't answered next in the white paper, but we propose them at the end where we're like, hey, this is just the beginning. There are certainly more questions out there that we're seeing in, as a case study of where it's for and impact. Again, that may just be unique today it's because we are an international destination for uh, hospitality and tourism. Thank you. Yeah, our white paper is, is full of incredible information. So I'm excited that that's going to be released here soon. We'll talk more about it here in a minute. But um, we have some incredible video from I want to show the video from the OBCA so you can see the new um, great campaign. Maybe um, while we're trying to find that, we can talk about the role of the LBCA um, relative to the evolution of sports during this community. Um, specifically, you know, the LBCA at large and the public awareness and awareness that they do, and then how your piece. Because the other thing is, she's also part of a massive group of people. Are you unique in school or three of the We are three strong with two incredible interns from UNLV that we are. And, and so just think about that. All this sport evolution, all these major mega events that are going on, is we said like that. Well, and Sam used to have a whole head here before we went to the events. That's how much work goes into it. Um, we are small but mighty. The LBCA is government funded. We are funded by a hotel room tax. We think we do reinvest in destination research funds. One, we are the official destination marketing organization. So we are the PMO. We have a $400 million a year operating budget. It's probably the largest in the, in the world, and maybe like one or two, um, but we're the best in the world in what we do. We also own and operate our own convention center. Uh, for context, Las Vegas has three of the largest, uh, three of the top 10 largest convention centers in the country, um, with Mandalay Bay, Cam XL, and Las Vegas Convention Center. Um, and then I have the house most popular in the sports. But the LBC as a whole does quite a bit much more than we probably realize. Everything we do is based on research. Um, we have one of the World's top research departments under our, our wings. We are responsible for airline service development. So we work very closely with the airlines to bring in new flights to the destination, additional seats when they're needed. Um, not only did we um, need COVID, we have probably exceeded COVID on the airlift coming to the destination. We oversee major sales. We oversee international sales. And we have advertising, we do marketing, 
finance legal. Um, I happen to sit ironically under operations. I had worked with chief operating officer. Used to be in sales and marketing. Um, it became very clear as we were working on the and uh, the graph that we were more operational on purpose. Yes, we were involved in that. We sell this destination to this destination. It sells itself. And we are the only destination to be involved in those tours. As a true testament to those in less thicker, those, you know, the, the infrastructure was the game changer for last year. We're not sitting here with the Super Bowl without the Raiders with the Final Four if we haven't built the BB Stadium. And I know it's controversial using tax paying dollars. I think we're going to get to that. Um, but again, we are funded by hotel room tax. We are what happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas. I think the campaign you're trying to show is the greatest arena on earth. That is our consumer campaign. Um, and I have a fundamental disagreement with our marketing team who believes that we should be marketing if we should come and just watch sports here. I believe we should be supporting the events we go after. Um, so I think with next week we have two big ones. We have Team USA, Canada, Panama, and Mexico. Those are both sold one for Thursday and Sunday. We didn't help sell tickets. That's not our job to sell tickets. Um, I'm going to make it our job to sell tickets. We need to support these events. So going after them, for example, uh, this RFP was Sam the Super Bowl. That's it. I was in the middle of COVID. I got an email from my boss saying, come get the flash drive because we are a government agency. So everything on my email is subpoenaable. So that day was kind of for public records. So I started kind of September. I think you came on board. I think it was in March. And we hit submit end of April. And yes, we knew we were receiving the Super Bowl, um, but not every event we know we're getting. We're not we're doing the final four kind of a basic thing. So every event's a little bit different. Um, and in every way that's involved in our league or the community is, again, different on every spectrum. So, how are we doing? Good. I can't seem to find it. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry about this. Just give me two minutes. I'm, I'm sure. Well, it's super cool campaign. Uh, shows showcases UFC and, and basketball and Raiders. And we have become the victim of our own success here. We have so many professional teams and leagues and sports that when you miss one, you get the call going. You forgot to include the ballpark. So we have to be very, very creative and generic in how we love to get that campaign is mainly a consumer. Yeah, and it's uh, it's interesting because we try to think we're getting into UFC. Uh, this is actually the headquarters for one of the biggest global brands in sport, and they have they have done it right. Whether you like the sport or don't like the sport, um, from the standpoint of how they built the brand and how they hold the sport, uh, it's it's literally a, a template for how to do it and uh, at least make it very accessible from the consumer standpoint. Well, and UFC is owned by Endeavor, so now they've absorbed WWE, so that's going to be another game changer for us. And talk about community, Sam. Where are your offices? Oh, we uh, one of the first partners we met with was UFC, and as part of our sponsorship with them, uh, we'll bring our offices into their headquarters at Apex for the, the production facility where they film all of their uh, Sam, I wonder if you could talk about, um, you did already talk a little bit about engaging with the community with regards to like the business connect. Um, can you talk about the, the impact that that has behind diverse? Um, Businesses and how you set that up to for them to be given an opportunity to and your commitment to them um, as part of the, the businesses within the organization. Yeah, the NFL has had a, um, a, a program since the first people I was involved in was in '97. And it was, back then, it was the, the women owned business program. And then by the time we hosted in 2002, it was the women minority owned business program. Then in 2013, it was the American business program. Now it's called Business Connect, but the, the big differentiator over, over time is they started to grow the the, um, the, the, the buckets of businesses eligible to state the programs. So went from women owned, uh, minority owned, LGBT owned, veteran owned, and disabled owned. Um, so what it is, it's an opportunity for the local host committee to go out and engage the local businesses to say, if you want to be part of the process, uh, the procurement process for Super Bowl, we maintain a database. We put on seminars and workshops shops all year long. Uh, it's really designed not just to make sure they get an RFP to bid. It's a business to business program throughout the year where they, they learn the value of networking. They learn what these RFPs look like to respond to something for Super Bowl. Um, in many cases, they learn it's beyond their capacity, but that if they want to uh, work on the final fours and college ball championship games and Super Bowl fours, where they might have to take their business. Uh, for those, but 
it's a year-long initiative, um, and then hopefully a database that we built and, and network of businesses that can uh, take it, restamp it for the next four years. Right now, I think there's about 200 businesses that ended up qualifying. Um, over 600, I think, applied. But once you go through the, the application process and realize you have to be 51 percent on this way, or you have to add your certifications, um, you have to provide your financials. You got to make sure that you can demonstrate that you have the capacity to do work. Experience of these work and that you have the quality. Yeah, so it's, I, I just really admire that program because that is one way that really uh, opens doors to local businesses here in this community and directly supports them because of those the work on your account. I can tell you just as a, a little you know, anecdote, I have a friend that posted on Facebook. She has a company. She actually runs drones. She's a drone um, specialist. And she won one of the bids or came one of the business connect. Um, business group, so she was thrilled, right? Um, we didn't even tell her. So, you know, it, it really changes people's lives. And I think that's that's the thing that maybe is overlooked when you think about something like a negative event. You don't realize um, the impact that they have on people's lives and communities. Andrew, I want to toss it back to you because I think you may have mentioned this, but one of the really interesting findings from our study, um, and you pointed, I love how you pointed this, was the phenomenon of sport members. Yeah, and I think you have yeah, you have a video or you have an image of it. Uh, but go ahead and tell us what that is and what it means. Sure. So if we go on one so at the end and conclusion, we compare a GIS map of every single facility, business, arena, park, school, essentially about sport access. And looking at LinkedIn and the sports teams that here on the website, um, you can you can you can click on the link if you want to just buy say businesses and you want to buy arenas uh, uh, simply put, you can see there's certain sides of town that seem to have underinvestment or under access to sport. And color coding, by the way, is just kind of the density in terms of access to sport and you're trying to compare some sort of model. Third is that you know there are sides of town that have a lot of access, and there's sides like the North East that don't have access to sport, especially with on the youth and amateur sport, as well as even just businesses in the area that might be able to sell them equipment or you know be able to provide them with kind of again um ability to do sort of cooking services, etc. So we were just trying to put together where this all exists and originally we were looking at the number of new businesses started. Uh, in the last 10 years that are related to sport and uh, related to sport. And we saw that that too had a very uh, certain character about it in terms of where it was positioned geographically. And so they had a certain area that that's what we came up with. And then we feel that there was an idea of sport desert, you know, in traditional economics, we think that uh, if there's an unequal access to capital or opportunity to flow to so those areas that are under investment, we've seen so time and time again in the literature, like such a thing is happening. So, why is it in this community and, and the leaders that need to be there make sure that everyone has access to sport? We, we, one of the things we found on paper is amateur sports, and especially with youth, um, youth participation, and especially young women and girls. We see that, for example, amateur hockey has gone up sevenfold with youth, uh, with young women. And, and girls in terms of their participation. We know that flag football, since they do also uh, move somewhere around, I was to say handy, but essentially it's, it's nearly double uh, since it started, uh, what, 10 years ago or so, 2013. So we can see that that the, the demand is there. It's just, are we also going to be creating the supply in the area so that everyone can participate, everyone can be a part of the evolution of our culture and so on? Okay, that you know, Sam, you and I had some coffee over this discussion, and I'm not too proud to go copy somebody else's example. Um, I was at a DEI convention in Los Angeles, and they talked about the Los Angeles mine. Does anybody know what the Los Angeles mine is? Following the murder of George Floyd, the uh, 11 owners of the teams in Los Angeles got together and formed a group that they funded to provide opportunities to those in the underserved in the desert areas with opportunities to play sport, with opportunities to see what careers were out there in sport. Um, I have now tasked a car team with developing that same concept. They're working in the campus of the family center with some funding there, or a new program that comes out. I plan to launch this Las Vegas Tech Alliance to offer exactly what we're trying to do. I think we found it. And again, I'm not too proud to talk to somebody else's footprint. 
Maybe you should all be in that country and just not. So that's that's not for public consumption on your social media accounts. Your first one from the other. Hi, Bob. I love that. Then you have a mic. This is on the panel. She's she's truly a leader in the community. Brilliant idea. And I'm happy to put her in the panel. I can't wait to see what comes of that. I have to also give her credit about another brilliant idea long before long before everyone flew up here. Um, we heard Dr. Barr talk about the October 1 and the impact of uh, overnights. But the other thing that happened with October 1 is, if you want to tell us story, tell us the story. What became the campaign program that has brought you together? Sure. So um, I'm a firm believer in giving back to our community. And I believe that students who come to UNLV have given four years of their lives and we should provide opportunities for them. They can understand firsthand that we are not working for local. We are looking for a tour to overturn every three days. And so it's not Chicago, it's not Orlando. And I wanted to reinvest in our students and provide them with ways into sports. Um, it's not just ticket sales. So what we did was launch a program in conjunction with Nancy, who's sat here for two hours. I think we had 200 applicants from UNLV at Bobby Carver membership. And we had the likes of the Raiders, Las Vegas Summer Speedway, people from the hotel industry, dinner industry, everything from legal to kinesiology to ticket agent sales. And we combine these, we pair them up and match them up to provide ongoing education. One month was resume writing. One month was uh, what not to do on social media. You should report things to follow you and your future employers and look them up. Um, and then we evolved the second year because what we found was that first year we had a lot of freshmen and sophomores and everybody wanted that memory because they were so invested in the music. So the next year we went to juniors and above. Um, and we continue to describe that program. I believe you guys are going to take that time over. Focus on the line, so I'll tell you now. Um, but we graduated close to 100 mentees, um, and our mentors absolutely love having that opportunity to groom the next generation. I'm a firm believer for creating opportunities for those who are being on the entire community versus hiring from outside. And one of the ways that the vendors come together, um, when the tragedy happens, all of these people that are oppressed, people like PR people or the sports teams, um, they need to be connecting each other. Right, um, there was so much going on where you heard like both days that both nights stepped up, but everybody else wanted to step up as well. They didn't want to step up, um, but Lisa was the center point, the connector for all of those people to actually come together and talk to each other. Um, and so they started to build a sense of community among the people that work for the different sport organizations, actually communicating with one another. Yeah, and that was what formed the mentorship. So we, we built a PR sports executive committee meeting, or the committee, and so we would meet once a month and we would talk with teachers. We're all in the same boat, we're all in the same direction. Um, a lot of you know Sports Business Journal, the magazine, Aid Matt has done an article on this. There's no other destination for the Golden Knights and the Raiders being Raiders named Las Vegas Motor Speedway. And we're trying to figure out how do we do this together? We had the ultimate sports weekend following that, where we had seven marquee events, including rugby, NASCAR, um, the Golden Knights, PBR, all on one weekend. What did we do? We went out and celebrated, but we did a global sports conference and brought everybody to town, and then we did fan fest. Um, we're not competing for each other's dollars. If it just gets everybody's in this together, that's a great message globally that we can just not be one events. We can do a UFC event, a football event, and have a NASCAR. I thought the final event was going to happen in this year. And then, so if everybody's in this together, this is our community, and we are rising to high street launch years. Uh, it's kind of crazy if you go to a Las Vegas Sacred game or see the Golden Knights that have sponsorship and so much you know, they pay for billboards. We've seen um, each of the teams support each other in our local newspaper. But, uh, good luck, you know, to the Golden Knights if they're in the Stanley Cup and the Raider. Um, it's very, very much a uh, all team, all boats. Or, what's that? All ship, all ship. <laughs> you all know it's rising time. Yes. Um, but Sam, you know, we're kind of talking rainbows and unicorns. Everything sounds beautiful. So um, I wonder if you could speak to any challenges that you encountered in this very uh, quick journey to some of the events happening. Yeah. I think the challenges are actually kind of the exciting opportunity. It is the fact that it's the first Super Bowl here. Uh, we don't have, unlike a Miami or New Orleans, uh, multiple Super Bowl plans to draw from to go back and look at. How do we do tweak transportation? How do we adjust public safety? How do we accommodate for as long as it's been normally every single year? Um, we're having to offer everything from scratch. So that's been the exciting thing for me. Our staff has a great line of authorship, but at the same time, is we try to figure out 
you know, it's the first time the stadium has been uh, secure for the federally mandated perimeter, which changes everything. So how do we navigate that? And during the bid process, when we smile from down the bid, that wasn't even a regular season Raiders game yet with fans uh, because of COVID. So we didn't even know what staffing was like at the stadium or sessions or how anything important. We were making educated guesses back then, and we're still um, right now beta testing and experimenting with things that uh, transportation and staffing to see how it comes to. It's a little scary, but it's also kind of exciting to go. And the concept of a security perimeter, it would land in the middle of I think at the NFL at the time. Like the family team were able to get that perimeter. Yeah, that is a federally mandated pretty much 300 foot perimeter around the stadium, but in certain cases that's impossible. And just as long as you have to make a, a pivot on that, it does work. Yeah. So this this is one of the things that I, I heard about that I think about insurance. We don't go to the Super Bowl post game and then going to the you could imagine like going to the airport and talking to them about 150,000 people coming. Um, and how are we going to handle that, right? And talking to both local um, and obviously federal agencies around security. I mean, that, that's the level of um, integration of screen for game, but also the level of security that you all have to be working on. Really I think we've probably all seen like in the Super Bowl, they always show the flyovers so you don't know that there's military presence and there's all this happening. But we probably didn't know this was being anything about that much at the time before the Super Bowl was in play. I'll give you an example too. I recently talked to some folks from Point of One who come into town and having their first event um, in November. And my pointed question was, what does success look like for you this first year? What does success look like? And they said, actually, to have no incidents. Right, because Formula One is a um, not is a event space that is insecure. Basically, it is a track that they're building right now through this city, with three layers of, of racetrack. By the way, all coming from different countries, it's phenomenal. Um, but there is no way to secure that type of an event, and yet they've got to figure out how to do it. Right, so. Yeah, there are very major challenges happening, and I'm sure that Sam is being very modest about the kinds of things that we look at now. <laughs> um, but um, I'm going to push over to you, Andrew, because one of the things that's also happening right now in um, Las Vegas, like literally happening, our state legislature meets um, biannually, so every other year. And you have probably heard that the Oakland days are interested in moving to Las Vegas. And it's always true that involves some um, investment from the local community. So they're looking for roughly 300 million um, to from from the state to move to Las Vegas and build their new facility and all the goes. So you know this is always controversy. Clearly, Allegiant when it was built got um, home and subsidization, and there's been a lot of different um, research done pointing to the success of what that's been for this city. Andrew, what do you think? I'm going to put you on the hot seat. You've got to, it's, it's pending with the legislature now. They have not approved it, and there's very different views on this. Where do you sit as an economist? Just throw me the hot box. Yeah. Um, this is the one that is the hot topic right now, for sure. Uh, look, so as an economist, I think it's important to separate the building an arena or not building an arena from public companies to building an arena. It's clear that building a Legion Stadium was the right move. We have 1.8 of the visitors that came last year for 107 events. And I think what's really important too was it's just the NFL games, but we got to host Taylor Swift and we got to host BTS for like four nights in a row, right? Like it sold out the town. And that you can see is the economic impact. As I mentioned before, four to four shops, one third of the dollars generated outside of that come from Legion hospitality. So as an economist, there's no doubt that so these kind of venues work for Southern Nevada and work for our economy. You know, I can't say that it works everywhere, but certainly for Southern Nevada, it does. And again, you know, I think we have what 39 events in 2024. That's just right now. I'm sure there's more announced. Um, through 2024, that's about 285,000 of the seating capacity that we have. So, any other question? You know, getting then into the question of public subsidies, I will tell you the literature is very centralized. And I just had a call with my mentor in Chicago where I got my master's degree. 
they bring technical apps, right? And it, it's just if I can ask those questions, the public asking those questions in terms of the channel of market dollar, which is not investment. I will say that again, because Vegas is unique, sometimes these things that they are, are different in comparing to say St. Louis and Florida. But I also would be, you know, the levels and details. And everyone in Stratton is very different. So we should say anyway, that was fun as well. Hotel tax very different than the proposed to this fall. In terms of borrowing off the official balance sheet of local state government and then having that be paid for special tax, tax system. I will say it's important in this discussion that we do talk about the perspective and make sure that at the end of the day that the public is being protected or at least the tax are being violated between the infrastructure that they're saying, I can also go to a gate if I'd like to, and not just our visitors, right? And then I'm stuck in three hours of traffic trying to get home that night. I think it's important for the community to have this discussion, period. And I was talking about the stadium or anything, I think it's important that we grow the in-house challenges that are not extremely access people for everyone so they can all spend the dollars and do more than themselves. Well, Sam, you've been in a, a number of different communities. I, I'd be interested to hear your, your take on this as well, because I'm sure you and you've had enough experience with local people and um, and other places, and, and sure people think that you get a lot of kind of tax incentives. Well, you know, in in the event space, so when you're talking about Super Bowls, Final Fours, All Star Game type events, those can very rarely ever happen on purely private funding. So they all require some level of public funding, whether that's a mechanism that, that a, a, a government put up with a, with a fund, or whether it's a special tax district, or whether it's tax on tickets, there are different ways to skin that cat. But what these event owners do not give you is enough assets to be able to raise funds on the private side. So for Super Bowl, we do get some assets, we get some tickets, we get our own logo that we can put out there for sponsors to recognize it. We won't compete with 42 other sponsors of the NFL. Um, all kinds of restrictions on that. Whole other uh, panel discussion there. Um, but it's a it, it's a critical piece to be able to try and find that balance of hopefully 50-50 public funding and private funding. Uh, when it comes down to the taxes on stadiums and major infrastructure projects, Obviously, you know, the, the spillover effect of that is then you do get to host these events. Um, and, you know, I, personally, I believe that, um, yeah, if you take it to the, the tax and the ticket holder at the end of the day, that's a pretty good model to where um, the, the tourists can pay the taxes on your stadium. That's not a terrible model. Yeah, I, I guess I'll um, ask a follow up for you. So it's the same line of thinking, but are we going to need get to a saturation point with how much the tax supports? Because that is something that comes up in Las Vegas. Like every time, that's that's you know in locals we think well it's just tax tourists or whatever it's not tourists not tourists we don't want to pay taxes. And at some point there's probably going to be a, a green to return on that. Honestly, I'd, I'd like to say that. Uh, unfortunately, a few months ago, Bellagio just went at eight hundred dollars a night, and Tropicana started six hundred dollars a night. The pent up demand for people in business. So, right now, I think we're seeing times are good. And the more we tax, I told you we have a $400 million company budget. That's coming from our green tax. We can only get 32% of that. 33% of it goes to education, part of it goes to transportation. So, every dollar we generate by bringing sporting events for venues to fill and fill hotel rooms, it's just a big snowball that's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. For me, the A on it, for Sam, uh, so I'll probably go back to Swiss Bank. Huge damage I can do with a new venue. I'm going to pitch the NHL on bringing the Winter Classic and then keeping it here three weeks for the All Star. We're trying to be a category one. No other destination has hosted both of them. I'm more concerned about what other events can we put in that in that building in that infrastructure outside the base. Baseball is floating through. Um, so from, from that standpoint, I, I, I'm bringing the others. We got another two hundred um, and, and you know, this is a beauty for us is we had mothballs out on the San Stadium due to C1 building renovation. We're missing that 30,000 seat venue. Uh, I love that the A's are being smart and building it small. I think baseball's popularity is, is, is diminishing. Um, I would bet dollars to dollars from the Las Vegas Bowl there. Um, the, and if our will not be there, I can guarantee you that. We want to use PRCA. They love the intensity of the MLB. Um, this just works for them. But we actually did a bunch of research, the intern saying, what other events could you put in there? We're not looking for a concert venue, but you know, they'll, they'll end up with some concerts that maybe a Legion Stadium um, 
didn't want, but no one's going to do it. It's going to keep everybody honest. And all of a sudden, you're going to see a legion is going to have to come down on the rental price. T Mobile is going to have to come down on the rental price. But we've got options now as to where it can advance. And I think that will keep us honest. And I think you'll see everything kind of fall into place. So, also kind of looking at the big picture, um, another venue that was built was the Bell and Loan Center in Henderson. And this is a much smaller venue. So we actually have three um, minor league teams playing in there. We have Golden Knights, lower level, but it's sort of nice. We have the um, indoor football league. The Foley, Foley owns both of these teams, all of these teams. Um, and then we have the NBA League playing in there. So it's a it's a wonderful venue. We have a conference basketball tournament in during the March Madness period of time. Uh, it's a venue that was sold to residents of Henderson. We don't know Henderson is it's merged with Vegas, but it's it's its own um, city. Um, but it's sold to the residents of Henderson um, as a place where we could also have concerts and we could have all sorts of things because we had an outdoor facility prior that really was only used usable certain times of the year. Um, so, you know, it was a very big period of time and you really couldn't use that facility. So, knowing we've got these three minor leagues, by the way, we have a triple A team, the Aviators, have been here for decades. Um, so, now we're talking about a major league team. We've got an NFL team, a WNBA team, an NHL team. We also have Oak Tree Group, who is, in the, is currently um, developing a $3 billion site with a resort casino centered around a basketball arena. So, again, um, if you don't know Oak Tree Group, it's Tim Wiki, it's people that build climate, climate pledge arena. Um, and the intention is they will get an NBA team, right? Um, so I'm wondering at what point are we are we at saturation, right? And I mean, I wonder if maybe you can talk about sort of the mix of locals and tourists and how we're making that work. So I don't know if Las Vegas will ever get to the point of saturation. We were Phoenix, we didn't build four teams on top of each other in four years. We got 150,000 hotel dollars for that 900 price point when you stay. You're, you're, we're, we're marketing for tourists. And I think, Andrew, you've talked about it a little bit. How are we going to get these people around? So let's talk about the NBA stadium that they're building with Oak Hill. Also, they own Brightline. So we're looking at doing a high speed train from um, California to Las Vegas to ease up on the I 15s. It's nine hours to get back on a Sunday. We've also partnered with Elon Musk at our property on the uh, Vegas Loop. So our property is two square miles at the convention center. You can, if you wanted to walk from the west mall to the south mall, good luck, you 110 degrees, it'll take an hour and a half. You can now get in a Tesla vehicle underground. Um, it is currently as drivers will eventually be autonomous. And it's a direct route. It'll take you from one side of our campus to the other in 30 seconds. There will be 69 stations throughout the destination. Um, hopefully by 2028 for final four, that's what we believe will happen. It will connect everything from the resort corridor to the airport to downtown to outside the community. So right now your traditional ride shares or RTC buses will be replaced with these Tesla. It'll work like an app uh, for context. If I drove from the convention center to Allegiant Stadium uh, on a normal day, it's 20 minutes with all these red cones and construction out there. It's 30 minutes now. I can now park my car at the convention center, get on my app, pay $6 per car and get to Allegiant Stadium in four minutes. There'll be a direct route. There'll be um, facial recognition type software. There was no public dollars invested in this except for what we use from the convention center for ease. Any resort that wants in or other locations will have to invest with Elon Musk, but there will be no tax paying dollars. So I think from a saturation standpoint, we have solved innovatively how to get people around. Now, now the sky's the limit. Just keep building because we found the ways to do it. And oh, by the way, zero emission vehicles, right? So sustainability comes to the point of everything. What do you think, um, Sam, with regard to infrastructure will be our biggest challenge in the uh, Super Bowl this year? Because you're talking about, like I said, 150,000 people are expected to come to the airport. Uh, I think people are amazed at the work. How many hotels are we have? 168,000 individuals saw out. That's amazing. That's an incredible number. They will, it will sell out. Um, so, from your perspective, you know, thinking about these kinds of challenges, what do you see from? Well, I mean, Super Bowl weekend here in Vegas every year is the second biggest weekend of the year in, in Las Vegas already. People coming to watch the game and, and sport clothes and on TVs and like, celebrate the Super Bowl here. They're not going to the Super Bowl, they go to Vegas. Um, now we're bringing the actual Super Bowl on top of that, and it will be the biggest weekend of the year by, you know, by no, no mistake. Um, so it's almost like the Marvel Universe and the 
the DC universe that are finally coming together and it's going to be. Um, as far as infrastructure goes, you know, that's, the, that's one of the reasons when I got the call from the LDCPA to come work on this project. I was like, hey, hell yeah. Um, nobody else has the number of, at least I mentioned, mentioned center space, the, uh, the, the venues. We're tracking 62 special events that come along on the coattails of Super Bowl right now from parties and brunches and concerts and all that, the other entertainment options that happen. Put that on top of what Vegas is already doing on any given Saturday night here. It's going to be pretty heavy. And uh, it, it's because of the infrastructure. It's the only city that could handle not displacing people to host Super Bowl, but just enough space to shoehorn a Super Bowl in here that weekend and actually happen. To that point, when we pitched the NCAA on the Final Four, our proposed footprint is a four square mile radius. In context, when we went to the Super Bowl in Glendale, it took 90 minutes to the stadium, it took 90 minutes to get out, and it's just kind of not a great experience. Um, so I, I firmly believe that the fact that we're still in the pack here um, is fantastic. When we did the site visit the NCAA, he actually turned to me and said, it's not a matter of if Las Vegas, the challenge for Las Vegas is going to be, oh my gosh, how do we narrow it down and what do we select? Because they've never had this many options. Well, it's incredible. It's amazing, but it's also a pain in the ass. Um, it's going to tell you, traffic is not easy, right? For um, when we have conflicting events. So, go. yeah, four nights go. Um, the the reality is that you know when we have events that conflict with one another, like any place, we have parking challenges, right? So we have um, challenges with just backlog of traffic. Um, I think I'm going to throw this to my economist friend. Like, do you think there will be a, a situation in which we actually have locals, right? Locals are, are famous for not going to the strip. That's just something that we know. People will ask you if you're local, do you go to the strip? And the answer is actually usually only when I have friends in town, right? Um, and, and part of that's because we have local casinos everywhere. We have lots of access elsewhere. We don't have to go to the strip, but it's also because they charge up to park too, um, right? And it's it's not easy to navigate. Like, um, it's getting better because of the LDCBA. But I want to hear your perspective, Andrew, from like both being a local, but also being an economist perspective. Do you think there's a point where local people say like, no, like it's too hard? Well, I guess first to address the question, I think about our local stadium right now. Um, so we know with the previous reporting that just came out that, you know, I think they initially assumed, you know, that there would be what, 15 local visitors, and they did not have to bring their visitors from the local draw, the local brunches, and we do have many events in Iowa, big events, you know, concerts. Uh, I know overall at the capacity of this one is on the and I think, you know, I don't know the numbers to see mobile because it's a private area, so it's the last one to say it's on the website. But I do know that when you go to see the COVID 19, we there are a lot of local rooms. Do I think that in the future we're going to have to address this? Yes. And I think the biggest thing is community is now coming together and be able to how we move people around. And that will make it more possible um, to say, well, we can do that, but we should be efficient and I'm willing to make more successful as a community. So I do think as a community, we're going to have to come together and help see more um, comprehensive and robust infrastructure to make sure that if I were to see a show on the strip, I'm not going to stop the traffic for a while. Um, but at the same time, our visitors from the airport also aren't stuck in traffic for a while. I have heard, I think it's from the day, but I've heard that when you do pull the visitors, they don't seem to mind the traffic. The locals don't mind the traffic. We noticed it. I will say, I was able to win, I do get frustrated if I, you know, for example, go to email meeting downtown, it takes 30 minutes. It's four miles away. You know, I was told, like, what can we do there as a community to essentially ensure that locals have access to this as well and not just visitors? But so that maybe we also can think about how. We fund that as well, maybe we can fix it a little bit more. But I'm now getting out of my box, that's another conversation. Yeah, just just for context. So uh, the the Las Vegas Bay is play in Mandalay Bay. So the global arena is actually within Mandalay Bay. And it happens that Mandalay Bay is also the prime parking for the There's actually a, a, a walkover that you can take 
Um, so that's why on game days, it could really be a nightmare. Um, but also, it's pretty convenient for our kids to be mobile. So if the Knights have a game, which they did, a slot three, and the Cubs have a game at the same time, which they're at least two hours apart, um, it could create it can create some pretty interesting challenges for really the folks at the resort casinos who are trying to get all, all of the parks um, and get all the time there. So yeah, it's it's not like in, you know every other city has its challenges in its different ways, and just looking for these pathways um, as well. All right, so our last question again is is kind of more of a, a fun one, but literally the folks here at UNLV and around town um, are now calling Las Vegas the sports and entertainment capital of the world. Um, and that's a pretty big bragging point. Um, I'm curious from our panel, do you think we deserve it? Can we actually use it? Or are we being a little bit above and beyond what, we, what we're actually currently standing in? I've been a daily CBA for six and a half years, and I have put that on my Facebook for six and a half years. Every single time we get the next, I don't know, welcome to the greatest arena on earth. I don't actually get that from here. Um, I say welcome to sports and entertainment capital world. I think we have um, and I think we continuously prove it. I think that the fan has a, a wonderful time here. I think our employees are loving it. I think the leagues are loving it. We've got WNBA Aces Champions. We're about to crown, fingers crossed, on the Corey Church, but uh, taking the Stanley Cup finals. Um, and that's great, the leagues. But now I, I think that the opportunities that Las Vegas has created for so many leagues. Um, and one thing I know that swimming sports is probably going to be a topic. I want to tout. Um, Las Vegas, the very first NCAA championship we ever held in Las Vegas was this last April, and it was the women's ball. So women's sports in Las Vegas, um, we are bullish on it. We are working on a very big concept for basketball um, that will include LSU this fall uh, in Mason. So no, um, I believe that we have firmly cemented our place as the sports entertainment capital in the world, and we will continue to climb. Uh, climb. Once we land in college football playoffs, we hit the trifecta of events. Um, I did want to talk real quick. I know we're out of time. Um, World Cup, you may be wondering why we didn't bid on World Cup. It would have cost too much to build additional infrastructure that we didn't have the use for at the time. And to your point, we would have had to shut down Allegiant Stadium for 160 days. Our hotel corridor was all in favor of Allegiant Stadium, so we could drive incremental in that. If we take them down for 160 days, that's not worth it for us. So, so we would do on that. So um, when you were turning down a World Cup bid, you are the sports center in the uh, I, I would say absolutely, definitely Vegas is time to and I, I can testify from only being here two years, but prior to coming here, what the, the industry perception of Vegas is, what the competitive needs of other cities have been on these, everybody shifts in their boots, and they know how to do everything less than my pops letting, but uh, with any event that Vegas is able to host, um, people are looking at that and deciding whether or not they can want to get on it for that. So, uh, yeah, definitely important to right? I, I did have everything that was said. I, I will say that we are a sport that's doing something well. We need some new people around sports around the community here. We need some local and like the new 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 local and yeah, and I, I have to applaud um, Andrew on the white super focus. So you all saw earlier the dean from the, the College of Public Health, School of Public Health was actually one of the uh, supporters of bringing this conference here. Um, and when we started working on the white paper, one of the things Andrew was very clear on is he wants to know about the work that we have to do. Uh, even though we're talking about um, economic principles and concepts, one of the things I want to share before I open it up for questions, Sam's just trying to find the video, so I want to share just a, a couple of really cool things um, to follow up on something Andrew said. He mentioned that hockey um, in Las Vegas has grown exponentially. That is a direct relationship to the Vegas Golden Knights. So not only did they come here and decide that they were going to um, be a very successful hockey team on the ice, they have created the opportunity for kids, for women, for all different people in the community to play um, hockey. And by creating it, I mean, they build facilities, they build ice and they talk. They have one person that's dedicated to developing uh, hockey in the city and the numbers are phenomenal. They really have shown that growth. 
Another really uh, big bragging point I like to talk about is, as far as our city, back when uh, uh, Clark County School District is the fourth largest school district in the country, because it's all, all of the biggest schools are part of this one school district. Um, and then any two little time I can see a few years ago, we did a study to find out, as we should, what the interest was. That's what I have for three um, columns of Title IX is to figure out what interest is not being met. Um, ironically, the sport that evolved out of that was flag football for girls. And that sport has grown to be just one of the biggest sports and is phenomenal in this city. And of course, this was pre Oakland or Las Vegas Raiders coming through town, right? Um, so much, it's grown so much, and we mentioned this. They started off with offering a varsity team. They now offer freshman JV varsity at every single high school. And now there are actually scholarships at NAIA schools for women to play flag football. So we kind of have been a leader in this space, and it's something that we're really very proud of. All right, we finally have a video. <laughs> Yay! So this is what I Things for one game, one race, one fight, one match, or one team. You come for the epic pre game and three days of post game. You come for the show time, the full time, and 24 hours of prime time because the game is just the beginning. Las Vegas, the greatest arena on earth. Oops, can still shut one. It's not so much a question. I want to thank you. I'm Beverly S. from Missouri Valley College in Missouri, and we met at I am school, and you have been fostered women and men's wrestling for many, many years, and we thank you. So I don't know how much more development you're going to do with NAI in schools. I'd like to see more because it gives kudos to the kids, women's wrestling, women's um, women's basketball, women's, uh, women's football. The props didn't make it. We are farm girls, corn fed, and uh, I think we're going to do football rather than the farm. But I'd like to see NAI and really brought up here. Kids love to come to Vegas. One hour is enough for them. Twenty dollars, two nights is too much. So. I don't know how you're in any of the Hopefully, Nancy. So, um, Sam is one of my best friends. Um, my uh, number two may have just recently left to go work for Sam. So, we are back filling her at NAI is on the three persons. So, my uncle's Disney National Association. Be great. Hi, um, I'm Ben Burke from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, my question is for Lisa. Um, you mentioned a partnership with Elon Musk and the Hyperloop. Um, I'm from McKinney, Texas, which is about 10 minutes away from the Allen Canyon outlets where there was a mass shooting recently. Um, I'm wondering if the LCBCA has any apprehension about partnering with Musk, given his uh, promotion of conspiracy theories around that shooting. And his right work tip for his transphobia in general. Yeah, I mean, so our partnership with Elon Musk was took place eight years ago. At this point, the LBCBA um, is out of it because ours is, is constructed. We are helping him, but he works directly with public works and all that. So I think that's the same thing. Hi, uh, so the question I think for Lisa and Andrew touched upon central costs from biological and um, and. I'm wondering if, Lisa, do you have any further data on what percentage of the night bank on the ticket or fire on some outside of Southern Nevada? Because um, at home, when we have sort of live weekends going to games, outside of COVID travel restrictions, uh, Vegas always comes out off of the boat. So I'm just wondering if it's something that's going to be. Yeah, as, as a tourism board, we are a sponsor of the Golden Knights. And we had some angst the first few years because the Golden Knights wanted to maintain home ice advantage. They would not sell tickets to anybody with the zip code outside of um, Nevada, apart from 
Um, they have eased the restrictions on this since the rangers have come to be now at least on to fight for you know PSL for the Golden Knights is now PSL for the Raiders. Um, anecdotally, I'm going to tell you it's probably 10 percent. Um, I'll let Tom um, guess if you can now get the tickets. They also have their season ticket holders who are requested to a night's plunge where you cannot sell your tickets out of market. Um, I have helped my friends from Edmonton get tickets if they email me, I email the Golden Knights if they, if they were to plan. Um, but they're really trying to maintain it's it's mainly um, not um, but it's. From year one, I think there's probably one percent of the time is there if you could get a ticket. Um, it's now quite ten percent. Although the Panthers in the other night was very minor. Okay, so my question is to the Jersey team because we see Vegas as the girl sport club and want to kind of invest in a community, but then our kind of club as the United States. Uh, being able to work in sports as an international student or just as somebody who is not from the USA can be very difficult. Um, how do your organizations look at investing in that talent pool and kind of how they can connect to the market? I think there's some restrictions on visas, right? Because we as the government can't underwrite your visa. So we're happy to sit down and then try to find a solution or something that works for you. We don't really focus on that. I think to your point. We shy away from that. I believe the NFL and town volunteers were not allowed to even outside of the United States because of the legality issues of the years. Um, so it's a great question. It's a great topic. I'm not sure it's a priority for, for anybody, but we'd have to sit down and talk to you about it. I, I, I can add that I've never been asked that question before. I'm intrigued to learn more because it's never at least point to be taken the 20 years I've worked, it's never been raised as an issue. So I'm fascinated to learn more about it. I'm just a little curious. Uh, over the last 25 years, Vegas has gone from like 70 in the media market rankings to the low 40s. If I come under, how much of that has been a factor in making professional sports more attractive to, or is it an exception? I'm not sure if our DMA actually has any factor in the sports, right? When we sat down with the Raiders and they were first coming to town and they were trying to figure out like, how to sell sponsorships, they went down that way. Their sponsors need to understand they were actually going to be exposed to all the people in the destination. So we kind of shift their focus as to, it's not your media rights, that wasn't really that big of a deal, it was more of the, the consumer of coming I mean, kudos to us, right? So when I started the WCBA, um, Great show has always wanted to be the number one reason people come to Las Vegas. We host more than 22,000 meetings a year. Um, sports was eight. Uh, we are now the bridesmaid. We are number two, and we will always be the bridesmaid, and I will hold that as a badge of honor. Um, we're not going to overtake the conventions. Um, so, I mean, it's, a, it's it's great that we've become a bigger DMA. I think it also is just because of the population boom that has gone from when I moved here at 900,000 to now 2.3 million. That's a great question. Well, thank you for and so we have all four of uh, uh, three teams, baseball. So we have uh, uh, football and we have basketball. Now, since we lost the king, we have a real problem. And we, all, uh, we are always complaining about uh, how much is asking of us to support these teams. You, are you not worried about this kind of thing? What would happen if you didn't have the tourist industry? Which, of course, in Cleveland, we don't. So, Dave Gilbert, who runs your sports commission, is a dear friend of Bill Sandheim. He is absolutely fantastic. And he brings the All Star, MLB All Star game every year, and NBA All Star game. Um, we don't sponsor all of these things. We will only, as the tourism board, we sponsor Raiders because they are willing to open up the database and sell tickets to a tourist. Uh, VGK, a little bit different relationship uh, because they were in first, and we do keep that going because we did build our loans and we need that venue. As we build on world juniors. So, we as the tourism board do not sponsor or pay for these leagues to come to us. Your question is also on like diversification efforts to Southern Nevada. So, as economists, we, we are uh, have trouble seeing every night, but only we're at the next recession. We know that the recession hit and it's been a harder task for at least the last two, and they've been unique to their events with the pattern they've seen. So we have been thinking about 
It says one in four workers are getting five people in salary, one four dollars, or five people in salary. Are there things in sport that we can help diversify the time? For example, we don't talk as well. We look at the new conflict country or the stuff that we have to Can we have intervention there so we need more uh, sports medicine? We just had a call yesterday about hospitality health care. So we need things that kind of help move forward both our big on how we should but they're kind of spin off in the other countries that can get for the to also learn some of the data so that we're not necessarily at risk for the next recession. Um, and so that's as for the times we're constantly thinking about that, working with our partners on how we can have these spin off of the other areas. I will also say that in doing the flight people, we also saw that things outside of the on how like coaching, for example, or some of these retail facilities have significantly grown in the number of our venture. You can see that there is like this entrepreneurship that's happening because there are also areas of kind of case studying there about marketing and learning from opportunities of marketing for local companies. There's a, uh, a big role for us to do things. The only thing I'd add on to that is that you know, I had the pleasure of 25 years working in New Orleans on major sporting events. And we always have the conversation in New Orleans about we have to diversify 100% blue, 100% blue in all of our age range blue and basket. And when things like Hurricane Katrina or the BP oil spill or COVID hit, devastating, obviously, um, to, to our industry. But our industry was also the first one that coming out of those crises has helped with or spurred a lot of the, the recovery efforts. So whether it was hurricane relief or the Super Bowl or the Bassmaster Classic helping promote that our fish groups are back in Louisiana, um, they played a very valuable role. In, and I think with that, we are at time. So I want to thank you all very much. First of all, could we give a round of applause for that? And I believe we have sessions coming up.